We attended the 344th session of the governing body of the International Labour Organization from the 14th of March until the 25th. The first week of the governing body meeting, we attended virtually. That was our budget week. And so we participated from the office here in Barbados. And we attended in Geneva from the 20th up until the 25th to, for the second week of the governing body meeting. The governing body is the board, so to speak, you can consider the board of directors of the International Labour Organization. It is made up of 56 members, 28 from governments, 14 from employers, and 14 from workers' representatives. Barbados is one of the 28 government representatives. They're taken from all across the world. We're the only small and developing state on the governing body. And so that is a responsibility that we take very seriously. And that drives our involvement and participation in the governing body sessions. The governing body would address matters including the budget of the organization, approving the budget. It also deals with matters of complaints brought against member countries. It reviews matters that also relate to conventions, those that are to be taken off. Importantly, it speaks also to and uh, considers what the agenda for future sessions of the International Labour Conference will be. The International Labour Conference takes place every June. The agenda for that conference is set by the governing body. The governing body also is the body responsible for electing the Director General. And this year, there was an election year, and uh, so we also participated in the election of a new Director General. So coming out of it, coming out of the conference, how is it going to benefit Barbados' labor market? It benefits the country. I, I'm not going to limit the benefit to the labor market. There's a benefit to the country. But let me speak to how it benefits workers, which is, I think, where maybe we're trying to go to. So I'll give an example. The One of the areas where we had lots of involvement from Barbados in the session of the governing body was a determination as to whether the conference for 2023 will discuss the care economy or what we refer to as just transition. Just transition is an understanding that climate change is impacting and that jobs will evolve in that setting as we move to green jobs but that the move from what we have currently to what the future holds for us has to be done to treat workers in a just manner. So it is called just transition. And we were able to, we were successful in having the governing body agree that just transition should be the priority. And we, we, we were very clear to them that Climate and all matters related to climate for us are existential. And care economy, while very important, it doesn't carry the same weight as the matter of climate change. And we were able to have our own group, which is GRULAC, the group for Latin America and the Caribbean. They, they actually shifted their position because of the representations that we've made over time and including in this governing body meeting. And they also agreed that they would support a, the just transition discussion in 2023 and the care economy discussion in 2024. That is one of the areas that will benefit the country, including benefiting workers. The governing body also discusses matters that speak to a number of things. So, for example, occupational safety and health as a fundamental right. 
in Barbados, we've been very strong over the years on occupational safety and health. And the section, that section of the ministry is a very strong section. We were fully involved with the COVID monitoring unit over, well, during 2020, 2021. And still to some degree, even though it's not as active now, because we're relaxing a number of the, the protocols. But the discussion on occupational safety and health as a fundamental right, Barbados added, added its voice to the discussion so that in coming up in, in this year, at conference this year, which is in June, which will be in June, how that discussion will unfold was part of what we discussed and agreed in the governing body meetings that finished last week. So that we will be looking at occupational safety and health as a fundamental right. And we will be looking at the impact of technology in the occupational safety and health space. So we were able to broaden the discussion. We agreed with the workers group that the discussion should be broadened because occupational safety and health touches on a number of different things. We were also able to, as part of our getting some movement in terms of how the discussion would play out in a conference in June, we were able to add something that Barbados is helping to lead on. Prime Minister is co-chair for our World Health Organization committee, attach, um, speaking to the matter of antimicrobial resistance. And we use that also as some leverage to move the discussion forward. That is another area in which workers will benefit because it brings to the fore issues that affect people in the workplace. COVID-19 has been, to some degree, a catalyst in the area of occupational safety and health, a pandemic, a public health matter, but something that particularly frontline workers would have been exposed to in a more significant way than other workers. And so having occupational safety and health high on the agenda, making it a fundamental right, which means that there is an increased scrutiny an increased an increase awareness of occupational safety and health, that also would be of benefit. One of the things that we discussed was a paper that represented an outcome from conference last year on inequalities in the world of work. Now, that was close to our hearts from a number of perspectives. It speaks to justice and social justice and the social justice committee falls within the mandate of this ministry. It speaks to non-discrimination, it speaks, speaks to inclusion. And last year, I had the privilege to be the rapporteur for the working group on inequalities in the world of work. What we discussed at governing body last week and the week before had to do with the outcome. How are we gonna move forward in addressing the matter of inequalities? And in relation to benefit to this country, formality and informality are ideas that are discussed when we're talking about inequalities. So we had, for example, in 2020, a situation where there were lots of workers who were not part of the formal sector, and so they were not included in the social protection that the National Insurance Scheme offers to persons who are part of that scheme. And so the idea of staying focused on coverage by social security, that part of social protection, because ILO speaks to social protection generally, but we focus a lot on social security. Social protection would be welfare systems and those other forms of assistance. But we were able, both from conference last year and then in our contribution to the discussion at governing body, move that agenda item forward so that there is increased focus on the matter of inequalities and an understanding that we have to focus on making sure that our workers are covered in our social security schemes. So th those are some 
of the areas we also were able to, you asked about benefit to the country. The election of a new director general is always a very major, based on, it's my first, but um, based on all the files and the, the information we have, a major event. Because the director general is the one who, working under the governing body, sets the agenda, priorities for the organization, sets the tone for how the organization interacts with its members. So we, talk, we talk about member states and social partners, employers and workers, so that the participating in the election process was important for us. We met with four of the five candidates. We met with them before we left, so that was virtual. One actually came to Barbados for a meeting, and we met with him here. Then while in Geneva, we met with all f the four, four of the candidates again, so that there, meeting face to face, we had a better opportunity to assess persons, to be able to speak to them directly uh, and get a good feel for the character, personality, objectives, the, the, the kind of person who we were going to be making a decision on. And I am satisfied that the person who was successful, who was the, the, the candidate that we supported, will understand both the, the issues of both the global south that we are part of, but also, very importantly, small island states. And we had, we had and have the, the, the privileged opportunity to push the agenda for small island developing states because we are the only small island state on the governing body. And so we made the point to the candidates and received commitments from the candidates and particularly the candidate who was eventually elected, I am pretty confident that he will deliver, that he will hear small island states, that he will be responsive to the particular needs that small island states have, in addition to the rest of the, the global south. All right, final question. So mm -hmm. what plans, programs does the ministry have now to advance the whole decent work Program. The decent work program <coughs> is really all encompassing. So let me mention, I'll mention a few. We have been sharing lots of information, but what we are working to do is to share it in different forms to make it more accessible. Information on labor laws, because the, the, the foundation of decent work is understanding rights understanding responsibilities and the decent work agenda means that workers have to be aware of what it is that constitutes decent work what it is that they are permitted to do not permitted to do what are employers permitted to do not permitted to do how we encourage dialogue at the business level at the organization level Th that information sharing is something that we have been working pretty, we've, we've been very focused on sharing that information. We've also been holding webinar webinars. We've had a number of those 20, late 2020, 2021, um, sharing information and reaching a wider audience than we would have if we, have, if we had done what we were accustomed to doing which is bringing people into the conference room here in, in the Warren's office complex. So we've been reaching more people where that is concerned. Another aspect of the decent work agenda has to do with violence and harassment. And the matter of violence and harassment, including gender-based violence and harassment, is one that is also very close to us and very close to me particularly because in 2019, I would have been one of the leaders of the committee that discussed that and that was able to reach uh, an agreement for a new convention, Convention 190, 
that convention speaks to preventing and eliminating violence and harassment in the world of work, including gender-based violence and harassment. And right now, we are in a program with UN Women addressing that matter. And the intention is to sensitize persons to that particular challenge. It fits in to, to the, we already have sexual harassment legislation on the books. We have anti-discrimination legislation in terms of employment, those on the books. And this allows us to continue the process of sensitizing workers because that too, eliminating harassment and violence in, in the work context is part of the, the decent work agenda. And so those are some of the areas that we've been working on as it relates to, to pushing that decent work agenda. We've also been doing some work on ratifying some of the ILO conventions that we haven't yet ratified. We've ratified quite a lot of the conventions, but there are some that we need to ratify. And what the process of ratifying the conventions does for us is that it heightens the awareness of our social partners. And it also heightens the awareness among our worker force on these principles. So when we are talking about the domestic work convention, as an example, which is one that we have to ratify the same C-190, when, when we are going through the process, we are talking to workers, uh, workers' organizations, we are talking to employers and employers' organizations, and reinforcing the principles that are in those conventions. So ratifying conventions is also something that we are working on. The matter of the minimum wage, which we addressed last year, is also part of the decent work agenda. Because when a person spends, leaves home, spends time at work, or works from home, where home becomes the, the essentially the workplace, the remuneration has to be sufficient to allow people to to live, as we say in Barbados, to keep body and soul together. And so that is a, another part of the decent work agenda that continual participation helps us to realize. When we concluded the conciliation with between BWU and G4S, the Prime Minister in the press briefing that she gave after was very clear to say that Barbados has always been very active at the ILO, but particularly from the workers' perspective. Um, Sir Frank, right excellent Sir Frank Walcott, then Sir Roy Trotman, and now Miss Tony Moore have all been very, very active. Government is now also very active. And she made it clear that even for conventions that we have not yet ratified, we live by those principles. And so it is important to keep highlighting those conventions so that we have the, the, the moral compass and the, and the guide that takes us in the direction of the decent work agenda. And also the term that we've been using more recently, the, the human-centered approach. So the Centenary Declaration from 2019 speaks to a human-centered approach to development generally. That was a pre-COVID-19 document. And since COVID-19, we had, I think we developed this in 2020, where we call for a human-centered approach to the COVID-19 recovery. So that we talk, when we talk about building back better or building for a better future, it must be with the understanding that we are dealing with workers who are human beings and that we treat to them as such. So Barbaros is very committed to the ILO, to the conventions and recommendations and protocols and at this juncture is taking very seriously its responsibility as a leader within the ILO. The ILO is over 180 member states. 56 of those, sorry, 28 of those are on the governing body. And because we are one of those 28, we are considered part of the leadership. We've been taking it very seriously and we have been pushing the 
agenda for small island states, small island developing states, and making our voices heard. We have seen from that participation, we, we recognize that we are able to shape the agenda. We've been doing that. We, 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 we led, basically, in, in 2019 on C-190, and in terms of the, the agenda for conferences going forward, we have been very active and successful in guiding what the agenda will look like, what the international labor organization will focus on. And the final thing I want to say on that, the decent work agenda will also mean that the ILO will need to be assisting member states. And one of the things that we have fought for, pushed for, and engaged the new Director General on is making sure that the offices that are in the regions are staffed and have the capacity to assist member states. We have a number of member states in the Caribbean and the Decent Work Office in Trinidad, which is the sub-regional office, is the one that supports us. And so part of that Decent Work agenda, part of the success that we are having in relation to our participation is making sure that we get benefits, we get assistance, the technical assistance that is required because we don't have all the skill sets here to do everything we need to do. We're going to be getting assistance from the ILO to move our agenda forward. Um, one of the things that we have discussed, haven't finalized, a labor code versus various pieces of legislation. So if you look at it from the worker's perspective, for a worker to know everything that a worker needs to know, right now the worker has to review lots of different pieces of legislation. A labor code brings the legislation together and we are exploring that matter with the ILO. We also made a decision that we will approach them to work through what could be what kind of technical assistance could be given. We haven't gone to cabinet yet, but to f just to explore what kind of assistance could be given in relation to our employment rights tribunal. So our, our system of dispensing justice to workers or to employers. And that is another area where we expect that the ILO will be of assistance to us. But, all, but of assistance due to our involvement, participation, agitation, lobbying, or activity within the ILO and within the governing body. All right. Thanks very much for talking with us, Minister. You are welcome.